Um, before we go into each of our, uh, uh, where we're coming from and who we are, I just want to set up the, uh, the context here. So, online learning and maybe the end, end of professionalism. So, my name is Vivian Ming, I'm the Chief Scientist at Guild, um, and also I previously spoke here at South by Southwest EDU um, on a lot of the pitfalls, actually, of educational technology, including a long screed against a lot of online learning. Um, so we're going to see how this all plays out with the opinions of our other panelists here. But let me just go through the setup. Online learning has been around long enough that the effects on the workplace have started to become clear. In computer science, anyone with the patience and an internet connection can learn how to code. Um, although there's some questions there. Do they? Just because they can. Will they start to more in the future? Um, so these forums actually allow something special. Uh, both the, the classes and also the open source world um, really allow us to go in and quantify the skills of new coders. Um, and people can go out and prove their work in a way that just has never been truly possible before. Uh, in a really worldwide way, you can say something special about yourself. For example, there was this kid in Mongolia that took uh, and like the Andrew Ng's machine learning course on Coursera and became the first person ever from Mongolia to go uh, and get a scholarship and go to MIT. Um, so that's a just wonderful example of someone going online, learning uh, these hard technical skills uh, and really taking it somewhere. Um, but what does that play out for everybody else? Uh, so the trend benefits a lot of people looking to break into coding, uh, and also a lot of us just looking for lateral moves uh, in our coding. So, boy do I see a lot of people, um, let's take it off online for a moment, a lot of people at Hackride Academy, right? for those of you who are familiar with it, it's San Francisco, it's a women's uh, coding school, and there are a lot of product managers uh, and a lot of marketers that really want to either further their coding skills or really transition into a new job within their company. Um, and a, a number of mid-career people, so we're going to talk about this a lot today, is what does it mean when you reach a certain point in your career? Can you really keep up with all the changes? Uh, and again, can this online learning experience help transform that? Uh, and it just goes on and on, the, the effect that it has on employers and being able to reach people. Um, but there's also this fundamental question. Does learning online actually train the professional skills you need to be effective? Uh, is it enough to simply come into a company with skills and learn how to be a professional on the job? So uh, to talk about this here today, in addition to myself, uh, we have these three other wonderful panelists. I'm going to let each of them introduce themselves in turn, but we'll start here with uh, Luca. Hi, I'm Luca. First of all, thank you for being here on a Friday evening. I really appreciate that. Uh, I'm a co-founder and CTO at Guild, so I work with VTM. Uh, I don't want to tell too much of what we do at Guild, but just to like set the framework. Uh, our company looks for uh, talent, even talent uh, using online data. And uh, we were able to like get great successes in like finding people that no one else could find using our technology. So uh, in this uh, framework, uh, mm -hmm. I would like to give like uh, my point of view on uh, what online education means from an area manager perspective. So like uh, how uh, employers would uh, uh, consider uh, someone uh, applying for a job having online education skills, but also somehow how the uh, employees uh, would uh, value like trainings that are based on online education. Uh, my name is Nick. I work at Code Academy. We teach people to learn how to code online for free. I currently spend a lot of time doing partnerships with schools, governments, and uh, companies that want to teach their citizens, employees, and students new skills. And as part of that, th this question comes up a lot. What, are, what do you teach and what can't you teach online? Personally, I've also had a healthy dose of professional schools. I've done a, a law degree and a business degree, so I've seen some of those other skills that we're talking about today in, in a different context and how, how they're taught in different companies as well. Evil skills. <laughs> Hi, I'm Jeff Diana. I'm the Chief People Officer for Atlassian. I get the uh, fancy software Bay Area title. 
Uh, I run HR, so I'll give you a perspective today on how we think about learning and implications for hiring and just what's changing inside companies today. Uh, we're a software company based out of Australia, San Francisco, and now Austin, so good to be here. Thanks, everyone, for the introduction. Okay, so let's dive right into it. There has been an explosion in online resource, learning resources in recent years, so Younger Kids, Code Academy, but really for everyone here in this room, Udacity, Coursera, edX, um, Khan Academy, if I just pronounced that wrong, Code Academy, Duolingo, all of these things out there for a variety of purposes. Some claim that they're gonna replace the traditional school, others that they're to supplement it. Nearly all kind of really focus on skills, um, although there are some exceptions. But are skills enough if the three pillars of professionalism are experience and personality and culture? Is are learning a set of skills online going to be enough? So can we go beyond skills training? So let me start with you, Nick. Uh, what can't be taught online? Sure. So I think that part of what we find difficult to teach online is a lot of the soft skills, leadership, and working with other people. I don't necessarily think you have, just because you can't learn it online, I don't think you have to go to a institution or a workplace to do it. A good example of this is all of the business incubators that have popped up. Many of them have folks that have no previous experience and they're creating a company. Um, if you look at people that created Airbnb or uh, Roku or some of, the, some of these other major companies, they didn't have a long laundry list of companies that they've worked at and, and professional skills that they've gained in other contexts. They built something cool, a lot of people use it, and they figured out a lot of these lessons along the way. So, uh, Jeff, I know you guys at Alassian have a particular approach to it, so what, what is your feeling about what can, can actually be taught online? Yeah, I, I don't think there's much that can't be any longer, actually. When you think about the social skills are the hardest to do, but with the social technologies that are out there, the use of video, the virtual classrooms, chat rooms, um, in some ways the paradigm is actually shifting. You could actually argue that online learning is a better way to grow people than classroom because so much of the way we work and connect both inside work and outside work is actually through those technologies. So there's actually some biases I think you avoid by learning through online. Um, and when we look at it from an Alaskan perspective, we're a software company, I've got people all over the globe, and we work through social tools. Everything is done online. So that, that definition, I think, has shifted. Can you make up for experience that way? Maybe not, we, we can debate the value of experience next, but I think from an online standpoint, there's more and more universities out there doing that, there's more and more incubators, as you mentioned. Um, and the accessibility that you get uh, through that, the fact that you are in charge, not the smart guy in the front of the room or gal who's teaching you so you can learn when you want, how you want. Uh, it's just a disruptive platform, just like you see in the software for business processes. Same, same concept that's happening in learning. I don't think it's going to stop. Sure. Um, you know, there's a lot of research into uh, learning and what works, as you might imagine. We all just finished up South by Southwest EDU in the few days leading up to today. Um, and, you know, one of the things that's well known is that people learn well in a social context. So it's interesting that you're specifically talking about effective online learning being a social experience. Um, but, uh, you know, our brain literally processes data differently when we're actually reacting to something. If we even see someone give the exact same lecture, but we know it's been recorded, it, it ends up being a different experience. So, Luca, um, do you have a different perspective here? I mean, what, what can be done? Uh, well, I, I think that learning is really about communication. So you go into like a, to learn something and uh, you get some content. Uh, the thing is that uh, the communication doesn't work the same for everyone. So uh, it really depends on uh, each individual. So there are many that prefer a more personal approach. And you mentioned, for example, the socialization part. Uh, many prefer a real life class because you can socialize with other students, and we also mentioned like uh, the you are uh, you are uh, you can go at learning at your own pace. Uh, however, not all the students are like uh, so strong in terms of mind and uh, dictate uh, a specific uh, pace, and that could become also a problem. 
uh, having like a, a formal environment that can dictate the pace uh, in many cases uh, can be good. Uh, we are all on the internet and it's very easy that you're doing a task and then uh, a Facebook notification pops out and then you are hijacking like what you want to do, so being distracted. So the fact that uh, you can uh, learn from home doesn't necessarily mean that you can be more focused. So clearly, uh, it shifts from uh, the teacher that can teach you something to the student that can teach to like, himself. So it can be positive if the student can really like, be rigorous on the process, but can also be like, very destructive if uh, the student, in particular if, if he's young, uh, can, can become a so, sort of waste of time. You know, the one thing I'd add to that, when you, we didn't talk about it, but one of the powers of online is the ability to get collective knowledge. So the fact that if you have a low friction way to interact, it's different from a classroom setting. You've got to wait, raise your hand, maybe be heard, break into a lecture. When you do it through these online mediums, everybody is thinking there is no pure social grace. You can't actually put a statement out until someone else completes. Um, it's easier to gather the knowledge of the collective, so to speak, of the people in the classroom. And we've at least found that's one real big positive to online learning that it's harder to get out of the classic classroom set up. So this kind of leads us into our second question. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to be both a bit of a devil's advocate here and pretend like I don't like online learning, even though I'm, I'm a, an ed tech person myself. But quite honestly, I spend an hour in front of 2,000 people telling them that uh, the, the way it's done today is being done wrong. So, I'm not that going that far off topic when I say uh, Coursera is very proud of this idea that in their online courses, uh, there are these star students uh, that end up being sort of mentors to everyone else. Uh, and they, they create these social circumstances, so online discussion forums in which people will go and ask these students uh, and ask them questions and get incredible feedback from them. So, that sounds wonderful, but here's the problem with it. That peer mentoring is an incredibly valuable experience. The class that I'm talking about is Andrew's machine learning course, which had 150,000 people in it. Something on the order of 20, 10 to 20 people ended up being peer mentors in that course, which is probably about the same number that would have been in a university course of 200 people, which then replicated across 150,000 people would mean so many more people would have gotten that opportunity to be a peer mentor. So to me, there's a real potential cost to online learning that doesn't happen intelligently. It's just left to go sort of spontaneously organize and create a learning experience without a lot of thought and detail. Um, but clearly, there are some bonuses too. So, throwing it out there to you guys, what does the online experience offer that the classroom doesn't? So, we've gotten a few opinions about this so far, but I know you have some more specific stuff, Jeff. So, what do you think? Are you really getting out of the online that couldn't be replicated? Strangely enough to think of it this way when it's the traditional is in the classroom. Well, again, I think as the nature of work changes, it's the best vehicle to represent how work gets done today. So much more work is done in team settings, so much more is done through technology, so much more is done remotely. So in many ways, it's a better way to onboard people in the nature of work inside organizations. I think that's, that's one huge benefit. I mentioned the ease of access to the collective knowledge that I think is a lot harder to get. Tons of value in a peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Don't, don't disagree with that. Um, but also just scalability. As we get more and more people in the workforce and we get more and more globally dispersed, Everything from cost to ease of accessibility, all of those things have had a shift to what technology can do online that's really hard to do in person. I have a head of learning and development. We still do uh, old school learning with classroom training. We still have leaders get up and have conversations, and that's a very powerful tool. So I don't, I don't know that I'd say it's an or, I'd say it's an and, but we really should lean in and leverage the, the online piece. It's, it's, here to, it's here to stay, and it's not the old school LMS. That's become a commodity. It's the social platform in a way that people learn. Um, that's the new one. So, Nate, what has Code Academy discovered? You know that you just you absolutely believe could not have been replicated in a traditional classroom. Yeah. So, I think one of the biggest things we've learned is there's 
different types of topics that people are willing to learn in a classroom and learn online. So if I said, if we all felt, you know, if we, if we were talking to a group of people that didn't know how to read and we said, hey, we're going to have a class, everyone who doesn't know how to read, let's get in a room and we'll learn to read together. There's not many people that raise their hand. And we see the same thing when we talk about coding. For, for many people, they feel like it's this, they feel uncomfortable that they don't know how to do it. The best example I have is when we interviewed this husband and wife couple um, from Texas, actually. And they were both learning how to code online. And so I asked them, oh, so when you, do you get stuck? And they said, sure. And then there are definitely times when, when I get stuck and I don't want to solve a problem. I said, do you ever ask each other? Do you help each other out? And I was expecting them to say, yeah, all the time. They said, never. We never talk to each other about it. We never, um, we never ask each other about it. We go online and post a question online and have someone, some stranger. They'd rather have a stranger that they haven't met who's facing the same problem that they are, help them along their path than the person that they want to spend the rest of their life with. How long have they been married? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I mean, four years. So there's this well-known aspect, uh, quality in educational research called the zone of proximal development. So pe ideas, people that are right in that space that you need them to be to learn. Like, just pushing far enough that it's challenging but not too far, that it is either intimidating or your comprehension. Um, so that's a really interesting example you give there, the, the personal relationship and, and the kind of preservation of the personal, personal relationship uh, online. Um, I know when we've spoken previously, uh, you sort of talk about the beauty of having these sort of really punctate learning experiences. Yes, I uh, can think of uh, two major points. One uh, is the ability to like uh, use the online education in the mm -hmm. snacks instead of uh, like a full meal. Uh, the way I see, like for example, my developer using the online uh, uh, training, rather than taking a full class, they need a very specific uh, topic that they want to know. They can jump specifically to that topic, skipping everything else. And once they are satisfied, they can drop. So that's great because you can really like uh, somehow build your own uh, class. You don't need like to take, uh, if you really want to know something about marketing and you are a developer, you don't need to take the entire class. You can just jump to the, that specific concept. <laughs> and I want also to stress uh, what you already said about uh, the accessibility. Uh, with an example, we have uh, a development center in Milan, Italy, and uh, every time we want to like give them uh, new content, something that they want to learn, uh, the local university has some great content for like uh, the type of industry we are in because like everything is happening in Silicon Valley. There isn't much going on there, or there are like three, five years behind Silicon Valley. So if we would go to the traditional learning, we would have to find the courses there. Uh, while with the online learning, we can set up uh, like lesson from Stanford, and they can access great <coughs> material and uh, we can keep them trained with like uh, the latest and the uh, technology that are on the edge and that's creating like uh, a great impact to the like a remote team that can uh, be up to speed with what like people are doing in San Francisco. So I'm just curious with everyone here in the room who here considers themselves a coder at any meaningful level and who here has really pushed that coding ability forward in an online experience. <laughs> so, a mix. Uh, you know, I, I, maybe we need to broaden out the idea of what we think that learning experience is and working online. For me, you know, I'm a computational scientist. Uh, I would never call myself a developer. Um, but when I occasionally find myself trying to throw together, you know, some little Django project just so I can throw a front end onto something, Boy, do I find myself coming back to places like um, Stack Overflow to get information. Rarely does it give me the answer I want the first time through. I gotta do a lot of research, uh, but it's there for me as a, as a learning resource. Um, but I think it's, it's un, I bet there's a better way to structure that learning experience. So um, that leads me to where we're gonna go next. So we've talked a little bit just about 
the educational experience of, of online learning and the value it plays out for you know three people in, in fairly different um, circumstances. But what does it mean for us, someone like me, that wants to learn a set of skills, maybe is looking to transition career, something along those lines? You know, the White House has some major initiatives around retraining older workers, sort of redundant workers that supposedly don't have the right skill set anymore. Um, or people that are trying to transition careers. But in Silicon Valley, there's this well-reported bias against all the workers, as well as some highly controversial biases against certain kinds of workers. And I'll let you imagine what I mean by that. Uh, so it sort of becomes Ner Newton's first law of older developers is that those out of work tend to stay out of work. Um, but now, supposedly, we have this ability to be retraining people and to actually have some tangible sample of their learning experience that we can go out and maybe recruit against or hire against. <clears throat> so uh, our next big question here is, what does a mid-career coder need to do to stay valuable? And I'm throwing this to you, Luca. What, what, what happens? Uh, sure. So uh, traditionally, a developer career uh, moves forward in two possible directions. You either become uh, like an expert, so you really pick up a very area or a skill and you become like a major expert in the company, like a database expert, guru, Java, multimedia, whatever. Or you usually transition more into like uh, becoming like people manager and uh, like uh, leading a team, uh, becoming more a technical architect. So the way uh, it can decide clearly which direction it wants to go. But uh, Linux learning can help him in both directions. So if uh, he wants to pick up and stay up to date, as I mentioned before, online uh, learning is great for like snacks. So in particular, if you want to get started with a, a new topic, and I can think of, for example, the buzzword like Hadoop. If you want to start uh, on uh, a skill like that, it's very hard to get started, but once you are in, it's very easy to like uh, learn everything that you want. But uh, it's very hard to find something to get started. So online uh, uh, learning is probably the best use case for this. So like uh, how I can uh, uh, learn enough that then I can start playing with the product and do like all the homework by myself. So um, Jeff, uh, this idea of what do you do mid-career and where do you go, um, seems like some of this is about actual learning and some of it is kind of more about credentialing or validating. Uh, so where do you see this playing out? Is this really about retraining yourself mid-career or are there real skills there that people already have and that aren't being appreciated and this is about proving it? Yeah, so the first thing you mentioned about some of the controversy around it with folks and retraining, one of the things that I actually think the online continuum is broad is the ability, someone like myself or recruiters that will look at someone in one area of expertise and one set of career wants to move into another. How do I how do I validate taking the risk on someone who's now deeply trained in one area versus the bright, shiny grad student? Uh, one of the advantages of online is I can actually see that they've taken, gotten certified in skills. Um, you know, there's all sorts of coding tests. We have our own that we've actually created and gamified to test people on. And frankly it doesn't matter what age you are or how many years you've had, it's demonstrated performance of the code and solve the issue, and that will win out in, in all cases. So I actually think it works to the advantage of moving from one career to another the value of what online allows to do, because there's at least a belief with online learning that it's easier to measure. We, we can debate whether that's the case, but there's there's a bit of a bias behind that. Um, I do think you're right. It's, it's with developers in my mind, it's street it's street cred. It's what what have you written? Who's following you? How often has your code been checked out? Um, uh, shamelessly plugging you guys is one of the things I love about the Guild product as a recruiter. I can look in and see who's got the most mentions, whose code has been used the most. And to me, that's the ultimate definition of whether within the community of folks that you're an expert in, other people are calling you an expert. Forget what the recruiter knows. They wouldn't know code if you hit them over the head, right? But another developer sure does. So, you know, specifically around the mid-career coder, uh, I think as long as you're staying up to speed on the newest programming languages, the newest approaches to development, if you move from waterfall to agile, for example, and you're up on those types of things, software is taking over everybody. I don't think we'll ever get to the point where there's more coders than we need. I, I can't see it. 
if you're making the career switch, I think online learning is a great way to certify you can make the switch. So how can we do that? Yeah, and our uh, director of finance at Guild, the gifts that we gave him is under the table. We won't have to report that to the tax authorities. Um, uh, I, I appreciate your appreciation of, of what we've had a chance to build uh, at Guild, uh, and it certainly is based on the idea that this online learning experience isn't simply a unitary experience, but it's one that's open and shareable. So for example, Mozilla wants to really go out there and push hard and had a big announcement at uh, EDU about their open badge program uh, and using that as a portable way to prove what you know. So, Nick, how do you guys approach? I mean, what is the actual learning experience for uh, a developer at Code Academy? Yeah, so we have um, we have a set of exercises that you go through with curriculum, and you can't really advance beyond. It's difficult to advance beyond the next step without getting your first step right. And for a long time, we thought that this idea of credentials um, it wasn't really necessary because we were, you know, we'd come from this world of people saying, I went to school X, therefore you should hire me for this job. And what we tried to create was this open sort of portfolio. So every user that comes to Codecademy gets a username, and if I tell you my username, you can see everything I've built, uh, you can see everything that the last time I coded, you can see what projects that I've done, and we felt that was the way that most tech employers hire, right? You don't, you don't, we don't ask we are hiring people, hey, what school, I mean, we see, because people put on their resume, but we, first question we ask is, what have you built, and how many people have used it? I think we're, we're starting to change just a little bit, because the, I think the way that I just described tech people evaluating other tech people is true, um, but there's a lot of non-technical people that also need to hire tech talent, and I think some of them appreciate having a certificate, or a badge, or, some sort of signal saying that this person has passed some test without that non-technical person having to understand, you know, what does it mean that you built this project in Python and hosted it on GitHub and have 200,000 people using it versus 20 million. You know, it might be difficult for a non-technical person to understand that, what the difference is between those two. Or maybe you use material. Okay. Um, uh, Bitbucket. So Thank you. Just Thanks as a possibility, I'm trying to pass back and forth a little bit here. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so, um, you know, there was an interesting finding some researchers made recently uh, looking in this particular case at GitHub. Uh, and it really, I think, went against what people think, and it really addresses this uh, issue of mid career, which is are these people's skills stale? Uh, do they really not bring anything new? So maybe they spend years learning COBOL, or they're fantastic in Lisp, and God hopes there are no websites out there actually running on Lisp somehow. Uh, I bet there are, uh, nonetheless. Um, and I'm sure I'm soon going to hear about it on Hacker News. But uh, what they found, what I thought was really fascinating, was you look at like the hottest new things that, that people are building. So Scala and Julia and things that are just sort of breaking now. Turned out that uh, older developers were actually contributing substantially more and better code than younger developers. Uh, and it's something that was so interesting that I went into our database at Guild to see if we could validate that. And sure enough, we see the same thing. Our, our ratings on developers, uh, on older developers, I needed to use a lot of proxies here to figure out whether someone was old or not. Um, they were out pushing a lot of code uh, to these projects, you know, like source code to the initial projects. And it made me think that they're actually bringing a framework of understanding the problems. That they're not just learning how to code and learning Scala. They know how to code. They know how to make this stuff work. Possibly, if they're really senior, having done it with tiny memory and incredibly uh, efficient coding strategies, and now they get to play with something new with all of their expertise. Um, so it's it's an interesting world in which we have available to us, you know, the, the real learning opportunities, the opportunities to prove what you know, um, but also I think 
even just in the open source space, there's an opportunity to learn and develop and prove uh, out sort of formal learning systems. So I know that was sort of the original driving concept for you, Lucas. So uh, I'm wondering whether you have some thoughts about how just simply that collaborative experience, as Jeff was saying, that a lot of this is just learning how to be a collaborative worker and a mod with modern technologies. Do you think that you can just go from code people right and say something amazing about them, or do we need other information? Uh, well, uh, I'll take a step back. Um, one of the, the ways that Eric works today uh, is that uh, you really want to like validate and screen people based on like uh, what they can do. So you want people that can come work for you and like, for example, in the case of developer, being amazing developer. And there are multiple ways of like describing how an amazing developer is. The fact is that it's really hard, it's not clear, close to impossible to like uh, put like uh, uh, observe directly how the talent of someone is. Uh, so what uh, the IRI process does is uh, using proxies to get to the talent. So the, the reason why someone coming from Stanford usually like uh, get uh, like uh, a better score in terms of hiring in any company is because you cannot observe directly what the talent is, but you can see proxies like uh, where do you work for before? Okay, you're coming from Google or like uh, what type of education you have. Uh, in the context of uh, online learning, that uh, is becoming the challenge because now the ratio between noise to signal will increase because now everyone can become like a Ruby developer and uh, add a keyword to the resume saying I'm a Ruby developer. So clearly the challenge moving forward will be how you can separate more and more who are the good coder. So I want to really see your code, for example, and not just believing because you put in your resume that you are Ruby developer, regardless if you're coming from traditional education or online online learning. Cool, thanks. Um, so we've got a problem here, which is that um, although we don't have total agreement, that there, there certainly seems to be this feeling that this is uh, an opportunity, really, where we can go out and learn something new and and change the the way that people gather experiences. Um, but recruiters are notoriously risk averse, uh, and there are so many companies out there whose recruitment process starts with where did you go to school, or where you worked before. I know, for example, AngelList, for those of you who are um, follow this sort of thing, you look at their little snippets, people describing the, the new startup that they have, and you know, they list three things. You're, Elevator pitch, you know, we are Grocket for Uber for skunks. Uh, your, um, who your current backers are. Uh, and then it says something like, team from Stanford, or team from Facebook and Google. Like, then when it boils down to it, that, that's sort of what matters. Um, and boy, I hope that's not what matters because there's a lot of research that shows that that sort of thing, the way Google itself will acknowledge that sort of thing is not very predictive of success inside a company. Um, so is it truly something to this worship of professional experience? Or in other words, really, what is the value of professional experience uh, in today's market? So Jeff, what do you, what do you find? It's, it's interesting. I think from when it comes from a college perspective, and there's a few hot locations that you mentioned, there's some credibility. It still has some weight. <clears throat> I think most of the I worked at X or that type of stuff is kind of going away uh, because innovation is happening much faster outside of traditional organization structures. So you're seeing a lot more of the hey, I wrote an add on in this marketplace. That's pretty cool. Let me go check that out versus I worked at Google or X, Y, and Z. Um, even within developers, I would argue there's a sweet swap spot between I'm either doing the startup or I'm driving something as it's about to explode versus I'm the big dinosaur. So it's actually, you know, and I think you could take that same parallel across other functions. The stats, you know, by 2019, half of the workforce will be millennials. So it's what, first or second job they've had? So we can kind of say all we want that professionalism matters. Guess what? Half the workforce isn't going to have it anyways. Um, so 
Does it matter more in certain roles than others? Sure. Right? In people leadership roles, would you rather say, I've got some scars to prove I've seen it? Maybe. But in the technical space, I actually think in some ways it works against you. It's, that's fascinating because I've, you know, I've, I've, certainly there's the, the image of, of the developer or the mathematician and they're sort of off on their own, you know, doing some creating. Um, and, I, and, you know, it's, it's kind of fair sometimes. But at the same time, you know, I, I had um, someone once on a, on a team that I was running, and although they did decent work, they were just always out of communication. They were not in, in the loop, and you'd have to go track them down. Uh, and so I wonder, maybe not, I mean, we already talked a little bit about whether these things are learnable and trainable online, but are they identifiable? So I wonder, Nick, when, when maybe less about the way Code Academy structures uh, its learning experiences, although if there's something relevant there, let me know. Uh, but when you're actually out looking and hiring, uh, you know, a lot of people are trying out new ways. Let's, let's give someone a week contract and just see how do they, uh, what do they like to work with, um, which is a very in-person experience I, in some ways. So what are you guys finding? So we... We look for, like you talked about, some, sometimes we look for these big external markers. So did you, um, did you launch something on, Hack, on Hacker News that got a ton of upvotes and you managed to survive the crush of traffic? Uh, two, two of the people on the, in the time, top 50 websites for the last year learned on Codecademy and have built businesses out of their, their companies by just solving problems that they've built, building solutions for problems that they had themselves. Um, and then we, we also do some of what you talk about. So when we want to know how how well someone will integrate with the rest of our team, because they're not operating in isolation, they're working with a whole bunch of other people. We have folks come hang out with us, you know, code with us. Even if you even if you're not going to code with us on our own stuff, do your own you know do your own thing and just hang out with us for lunch or dinner just to see how you gel with the rest of the team. So. Luca, do you think there's ever going to be a way to get an answer to that sort of a question without going through the process of flying someone in and sitting them down? Well, it's definitely like uh, an art problem to solve. Uh, we are not the only one trying to solve this problem, but there are like uh, technologies that are thinking how to address this. Uh, clearly, like uh, today, not just like the online learning, but the online in general. Any candidate uh, using social media is putting out a lot of content and uh, like giving like a, a sort of picture of who the candidate is. So even before flying someone in, you can still get a sort of picture of, uh, for example, Jeff was mentioning like the dinosaur. So you can still see, for example, even from a type of culture and uh, personality, would be someone uh, that, for example, in our environment, we're a startup. Uh, we you must be very like. Uh, risk aware and take risk uh, every day, would someone with these traits uh, would be a good fit for us. So yes, clearly more and more, also with the explosion of the content that we, is being published on social media, it's getting easier to like, pick up some of the signal and clearly also the technology is also helping in like automating this process so that you don't need to go like, and check every blog post. But definitely something that uh, we will see in the future. I mean, I, I see people sort of rebelling against that. So the best example I have is, I remember being online and all of a sudden I was on Facebook and I, I, there were all these people that I had never recognized before and their names were this big jumble of characters. And I was like, what is going on? So I look at the pictures, like, oh, that's Anne. Oh, she's applying for residency. She's changed all of her information so that she can't be tracked. Or, oh, this person's about to defend their thesis. Everything has been changed. The twit, like, oh, this person's about to apply for a really competitive job situation, and they change literally everything, or shut everything down, or make everything private. Um, so I think it's, I think people want to have this division between what they consider, how they act amongst their friends, and how they act amongst their friends online, and how they act professionally. And I think you see some of that with the way people act on LinkedIn versus Twitter or even Facebook, right? So LinkedIn people share very professional articles, have five tips for being a better leader. 
and on Facebook they'll share the BuzzFeed, you know, 10 celebrities with terrible nose jobs or something. <laughs> and so it's, I mean, I think it's very different, and I think that the more signal that, the more technology that starts to exist where people feel like those personal spaces are going to be evaluated, the more they will shut them down, close them off, and make them private. Yeah, but it, I mean, it's fascinating because, it, uh, needless to say, and, and you actually make the point of, of mentioning people that are maybe going, heading towards their thesis defense or heading towards completing their college and, and engaging in this behavior. Uh, needless to say, it goes on long before where, you know, the, the, the privacy debates in, with education data are enormous and, and through the roof. Um, so it seems a real challenge. We want this stuff to be open. We want to be able to share. We want to be able to learn. Uh, but then we only want that out there on our own terms. Uh, and the funny thing is, um, so I can say this from a lot of the research uh, I've done, sort of analyzing resumes, uh, analyzing people's LinkedIn profiles, is that uh, those highly polished profiles are full of your you want to know what data scientists think when they look at it, they're full of tip-offs. It's so <coughs> obvious who is real and who isn't uh, in terms of their skill sets. So when you know I see someone listing a certain set of skills or certain patterns of skills or describing themselves in a certain way in a bio, believe it or not, for most sophisticated companies, you're telling them a lot more than you think that you're telling them. Um, and in a way, I, uh, to throw my own two cents in here, boy, and this goes from kindergarten through, uh, you know, your second careers after you retire, is do great work and get it out there. Nothing, I mean, no one's going to care about a lampshade on your head in some Facebook photo. I might care if they're sharing the bad nose job story. Um, it wasn't my fault. Uh, and. But compared to the value of actually seeing the quality of the work, uh, and quite frankly, how real a person is to know whether they're a good cultural fit for the company, this desire to keep every option open, I think, is, is taking it the wrong way. I don't want every option open. I want the right option open. Uh, uh, you know, I'm going to throw this out there for a particular niche uh, as a LGBT um, tech person is uh, you get a lot of, I've been to panels where people say, you know, you're afraid telling VCs uh, uh, that you're gay, and they say, hell no. I want my board to be behind me all the way. I don't want someone there just because they're willing to give me money. I want them there because they want me and my idea to succeed. Uh, and I think we should be looking for that in our employers and in our workplace. And I'm biased here because I build the algorithms, uh, as many many others do, that, that really are going out there and pulling this information in. But I think it's the way of the future, anyways. And you're you're better served by being uh, open and honest and doing great work uh, than you are by hiding it. Um, having said that, we're heading in towards the last 15 minutes here, and I want to save at least 10 minutes for questions. Uh, so I'm just letting you know, we're headed to the last question I'm going to throw out to the panel, and then I want to open it up and give you guys a chance to ask some actual professionals some questions, uh, and then I can BS a little bit too, if you'd like. So, um, uh, this is definitely for the crowd here. How do you balance this. You're a hiring manager, you've got all these tools we've talked about, you've got people coming out with badges, they've been to Code Academy, they've been to Hackbright, um, they are uh, applying for a position, and they look great, like, you believe it, you know, you know that the Code Academy experience worked for them. You can see the code they've written in Bitbucket or some other companies, uh, sort of, um, but the, there's a big question there about their social skills, and we kind of talked about how you can get at it with this really intensive process, but where's the balance then as a hiring manager? Yeah, so, so I cringe a little with the concept of social skills, I think what we're really talking about is culture fit, and I think they're slightly different. Um, we could actually have had a panel arguing whether social skills matter anymore. 
uh, because of the nature of work, how many people are coming into offices, how technology is changing the way people connect and share information. I think the concept of social is through technology more than person to person and face to face in many ways, which in many ways de-emphasizes the classic notion of uh, social skills. So I take raw talent over social skills any day, um, mostly because I think I can teach the cultural nuances of my company. I think the best way companies are recruiting now is not trying to screen people, it's trying to let people screen them. There's just a really big shift in can you crisply lay out your culture, which to me is your sense of social skills, how do we interact, what's okay, what will piss me off, what, what's the way to collaborate. The better you brand and put that out there and allow people to enter your funnel or not is the absolute best way in my mind to do that. It's a little counterintuitive. I still want my recruiters trying to do everything they can to flag behaviors or things when they interview, so I think there are some ways to do that. But I actually think you'll see much more emphasis on this is us, this is what we stand for, this is how we work, describe that videos virally that you push out there. They get the screen happening from the other side. So I'd vote for raw talent and culture fit, and I'm, I can deal with all different degrees of social skills. So let me just get a quick definition on raw talent. So you could have someone come in with skills. You know, they're going to deliver on day one. You could have someone come in with some currently unquantifiable that you think is going to turn into something big with some training. Is there, is there a trade-off there? I think it depends on what you've, what you've got in the org today and what you're hiring for. I know it sounds like a little bit of a sitting on the fence question. If they've got hard, specific, technical skills, and that may not be developer in any functional area, that's obviously a win. But we hire for raw smarts and people are just willing to take risks, have a spark of intelligence, that you can put them in situations and they'll find a way to do something. Yeah. So it's usually a combination of those. So Nick, what is your experience as a hiring manager? Um, so I think for us, we're the, the biggest eliminator, the biggest place that we're going to get sort of screened out is on the own culture fit. And I think um, there are a lot of reasons. I mean, we look for people that can work well with our existing team. We have a very small team. So we have 17, 18 people we support something like 25 million users. So each additional person we add is so important. Um, and I think that for us, when we you know, when I look at other places where culture matters, where they've tried to systematize it or um, make it more of a process, people fake it. So the best example of this is uh, admission essays. So if you, when you apply to business school, and thousands, tens of thousands of people do, the admission essay is, is the biggest thing that, I mean, there's, a, there's your test score, which gets you in the door, and then your essays get you admitted or not. It makes a difference between whether you go to a top five or top 10 business school, or you go to a top you know, 400 business school. And what, what do people do? They fake it. So they hire professional writers to write that for them. And I think the more you try to, I mean, people are always going fi to find ways to try to get around some of this stuff, and I think it's very hard to fake in person. I think that's why we continue to come back to that. I think there may be technological solutions that you know, smarter people will be able to figure out, but for now, um, you know, the thing that's hardest to fake is something live and in person. So look, I'm gonna give you the last word here before we go to questions. You're the hiring manager here at Guilds. What does that mean? Oh, well, uh, I go for the opposite. I would go for like social over uh, skills. Uh, probably also because I have some biases. First of all, uh, I think it's easier also like uh, without like seeing the person to understand like uh, technical skills. Like uh, if I can see the code, if I can see like all the contribution, I can already like pre screen and uh, like focus only. Would this be a good uh, uh, fit for our team? Uh, also, I believe that uh, any project evolves, so the skills that are needed to like uh, keep the project running are constantly changing. So rather than having an expert, I would rather find someone that can be like flexible and being able to like uh, constantly be up to date and pick up the new skills that are needed for the job. While I think it's uh, really hard, at least in my experience, to change uh, like the culture profile of someone and uh, make sure that, for example, it can be like a good team player. So definitely in the screening process, I would uh, like be focused more on that, assuming that uh, there is uh, already a pre-screening 
at the beginning of like uh, the technical field. All right, so uh, we've gone through, we talked about the potential of online education. We've talked about that, what that means now in the hiring space. Uh, so let's go after some questions, and we've had someone very kindly waiting with his hand up for a while here. So we've got a mic, uh, just to make certain we can uh, identify you later uh, on film by the NSA, so please go right <laughs> Excellent. Uh, thank you, panel, for being here. Great stuff. Um, so my question was around um, beyond uh, coding and that continuing education side. I mean, like I said, you can kind of measure that and see what some artifacts that people have done. So what about um, folks where it's a little bit difficult to measure, like project managers or marketing people, product owners, those kind of folks, and what you look for in continuing education, what resonates with you, just how to kind of ascertain that, that fit a little bit. Well, go for it, what do you think? Uh, well, definitely, like, uh, uh, moving from uh, like engineering to other role, like uh, having a measure of the talent becoming harder and harder. Uh, for like different reasons. Also, like during an interview yeah. process, uh, profiles that are not uh, technical or like measurable are always harder to like measure in general in like even an interview process. So you could have the same person going through like uh, an interview process, and based on uh, who finds during like uh, his path, you can get to a completely different uh, opinion. So definitely, it's a very hard challenge. Still, uh, there are factors that uh, for any profession you can still pick up. Like uh, we mentioned before, for example, like uh, social media and other activity that you can uh, still find and analyze. At the end of the day, more than uh, like uh, score people, it's about uh, what type of data you can bring on the table that is not necessarily like self-reported. I think that's for me what is the most interesting part. And connected to the online learning, I feel that there are many fields where you can uh, analyze, like uh, not just uh, the fact that they took like some classes, but also, for example, uh, how they perform during the, the education. We, we mentioned before that uh, with online learning, you can uh, set your own pace, and I feel that that, for example, is a good factor in understanding how long a person will be able like to pick a new skill, regardless if it's technical or not. Yeah, and I think for. Um you know, certain things, and I'm not saying this with great expertise here, but when you think about a salesperson, for example, um, even just, you know, basic skill set, I bet there's a lot to be done in simply laying out a learning experience around what does it take to prospect? Um, you know, it's not that that's the hardest, uh, most technical skill, per se, uh, compared to, you know, learning how to compute the area of some geometric shape, but it's still something where I bet there's a lot of sharing and collective knowledge that someone can really get a hold of in the online space. How to be a closer, now that's interesting. I would love to see the online class on how to close deals, and I'd be right there in it. Um, definitely not teaching. So uh, I think we are. Okay, so first of all, I love online learning. I think it's amazing. I wish I had a lot of resources available to me as a computer science major um, in college. I have two questions. Number one, I guess mainly geared for Code Academy, is I think I think there's a, not, I guess, people feel that coding is kind of all that computer science is, and I think computer science and being a programmer really lies in understanding fundamental problems and the approach to solving those problems and being efficient in that. Um, so I was wondering how do you kind of model that TA to student interaction in solving those problems and ensuring that the approaches are right and um, kind of beyond that. And then the second question, I don't know if you guys do this, but post hiring, how do you validate that somebody with a computer science degree is at the same level as somebody that perhaps you know, was certified on these online courses. Sorry, <laughs> Sure, so I think for us, you know, we, this was, the whole site started because one of the founders, Zach, wanted to learn how to code. And he'd been to and through some of those courses where you learn algorithms and computational thinking and some of that other stuff. And I think he found it to be, it was abstract for him. 
for him trying to solve a particular problem. So I think for us, what we have found that we've tapped into is there's a lot of people that want to do something concrete, and they don't need, it's, it's sort of the difference between an architect and a person that just puts up a two by four, right? So if you want someone that can create the huge skyscraper and the small house and the, the ranch and the, the, two, the split level, certainly there's a lot of information that you might need. But if you just want, if, if your goal is just to create something because you've got this itch and you want to know if this idea works, um, it may be possible to sort of cut out some of that. I and mean, it's not to say that we don't think it's important. We try to also teach some of that stuff as you're doing, as you're, as you're going through our curriculum. But certainly the emphasis is on learning by coding immediately as opposed to studying some of these more theoretical concepts. So actually, before we get into the nitty gritty of predictive talent uh, analytics and which we'd love to share about, I'm just curious how, Jeff, how do you guys handle your, I mean, without giving any secret sauce away, how do you guys handle sort of internal talent management and assessment, I mean, what goes into it? Yeah, I think in the technical tracks, it's always the easiest, right? I, mean, I think I can put people through, and I can look at the quality of the code, I can look at how they've done against the sprint we've got them on. So I've got a lot of that stuff. To, to your point about the pieces around that of identifying issues and solving those, that's a lot harder. And you gotta trust on the feedback inside the organization. So everything from when people are asking a question, which we do online through our own product, have you seen X? Who are the people that are actually answering those questions? Who are the people asking the questions? There's still so much focus on the answering, not the asking. We pay as much attention and actually look at who's asking questions as a measure of uh, being constant learners as those that are giving the answers. And frankly, sometimes the questions are more fascinating and impactful than the answers themselves. So we look at those couple combinations in a big way. And then we have all of the classic Pass that HR people have done for a long time, and I learned back in my GE days of a fuller talent review that goes through and gets that 360 view and looks at people against each other. But it's definitely easier in the technical, and I think that's partly why you've got a lot more online certifications and things on the technical, because you can more easily demonstrate it, quantify it, and say this is what it is. So I'm going to leave it to Luca to actually answer what uh, how Gilda approaches that particular problem. But let me throw out a problem that recently was put in front of me um, from two separate groups uh, in the Army, so the Office of the uh, Chief of Staff of the Army and the Secretary of Defense, and they said, how can we tell when we're recruiting some high school kid, 19 years old, whether or not this is someone that's going to eventually be worth putting into officer school and being promoted up into the ranks and to be a leader? And I said, I have no idea how you're gonna do that. But this is the kind of, you know, we're cutting a lot of money out of our military budget when the White House has a huge problem with retaining uh, STEM employees because people like us pay them a lot more money. Uh, when uh, there are issues of, of bias in the workplace that isn't just restricted to the tech world, but certainly is, is highly salient here, how we can actually go in and say not only um, how does the market respond, so who, who is going to get hired at, at whoever, Facebook, what have you, but who should get hired? And I can't name them, we recently had a company call come to us and say, help us figure out who we should promote internally, not who will get promoted in time in terms of but who should be so we can create the culture we want to create. That is a big and cool problem. And it is the kind of thing that I think we can dig into. So I'm gonna leave, again, the last word to you, Luca. Uh, well, maybe quickly because I think they are like throwing us out of the room. <laughs> uh, I think there is a lot of uh, statistical analysis that you can do. Like, uh, uh, as they mentioned, there is a multiple step that any IV manager would do in evaluating, for example, code. And many of the steps can be automated. Yes, it looks like uh, it's not like a science, but it's an art. But actually, actually, it is a science. Any QA engineer knows like what metrics has to look into the code. There are like uh, from 50 years of literature on how to, for example, analyze code structure and looking at commits and so on. So 
based on all these uh, uh, signal and uh, statistical analysis that you can put on top of it, you can uh, get a sense automatically on uh, like how someone is performing. And then you can also look at other signals, for example, is this a developer writing code that nobody cares? Or like, uh, is this like, is the office project on Bitbucket? <laughs> and, uh, Google code. and we're done. <laughs> and based on all of that, you get uh, a great uh, overview of like, uh, of the developer. You can correlate also the activity on the Q&A website like Stack Overflow, and then you get a really like good picture of what the developer is, uh, is doing. And also you can not measure the level of passion, but clearly if someone is spending all the night developing a pet project, that's a great indication that uh, he's not doing just for the money, but uh, there's something else. I mean, working through the night is a negative predictor. Oh God, what does that say about me? Uh, well, thank you all very much for coming. We had a lot of fun.